Okay. <laughs> yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, I am yeah. ready to go. Oh, thank you all for coming today. We've already had some questions on who in the heck was James Kennedy Cornwall. Yeah. Um, also known as Peace River Jim. Oh. And also known as Apostle of the North. Now do you know the name? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So this guy crammed more into one lifetime than probably 10 or 12 other people. He was a hunter, a trapper, a trader, a riverboat man, he drove dogs, he was an MPP, which is like an MLA today, um, and most of all an investor and entrepreneur. So this lives off of one of the many, many articles written about him. So I looked this morning just to find out how many references I have in my spreadsheet I'm keeping, and there's over 300 in newspapers and magazines and books and whatever. So nobody's actually, this is really gonna be a watered down version of Cornwall today. Um, nobody's written a book about him, he's been mentioned in many, but this is a book, a transcript of a book uh, that James McGregor wrote. So, <laughs> that's one of my reference materials, so anyway. So he left home when he was about 15 years old. The first place he headed was to New York for Buffalo, where he sold newspapers. Then he got a job on ships and started sailing around the world in merchant ships. He actually walked the entire railway system in Russia before he came back to Alberta. So by the time he came here in 1886, which, or sorry, 1896 when the boat that picture was taken, he had traveled the world three times. And I already mentioned Russia, but after losing his money in the Chicago grain market, then he came to Alberta, but he had already been to also South America where he got shot by some rebels. So, you know, before he ever arrived here, he had an exciting life. <laughs> and then things got real interesting. So locally, he had a significant impact on our community. This is Mirror Landing, for those of you that have never seen it before. This is probably around 1906 when it was first being built. So I have my redneck pointer here today. <laughs> so this, I don't know if you guys can see it back here, but see this little kind of spot here in the water? If you go down to Mirror Landing today, and I'll show you on the map in a second. I, that's where they put the boats in because this was the original warehouse and this was the telegraph office and Captain Barber's house. So that was the beginnings of Mirror Landing and then it kind of ended up like this. So okay. there was over 30, Is 40. Is that supposed to be down for a mile Yeah, I'll show you here in the next one. Okay, I'm gonna back up one notch because this building here is this building here. So the, the first one where I saw it said the water was coming in, that was the original, I'll call it a wharf, um, or a dock and a warehouse. This was the second warehouse, that's at the Basket Forwarding Company. So now I'll show you where it is in relationship to Smith. So here's the railway tracks for it going over the water. This is Lucy Dixon's, this is Myra's. Okay. So this was the Mirror Landing town site proper, we'll call it. Oh. And that little piece of water that I said was going in, I think is this weird little thing going right like that. So she A channel that's not the in. mill site where that... No, the mill site is over here where it's Okay. Okay. So when the railway was coming through in 1913-14, Mirror Landing was a steamboat warehouse town. So they were advertising it as, hey, buy your stuff here, because then you don't have an extra week's worth of shipping out at Edmonton. So everybody's all excited. And they formed the Mirror Landing. It actually got incorporated as a village, but the village was called Fort Cornwall. James Kennedy Cornwall, that's who it was named after. So on the, on the Mirror Landing homestead records, there's a little line saying, does anybody else have claim to this? And Captain Barber is the guy that homesteaded it, but he said Cornwall because of the Northern Transportation Company, because of the boats. So there's our 
right side. But not only that, we've already talked about the thing, St. James Catholic Church, and I don't have that exactly correct, but it's called St. James because James Cornwall was the original benefactor of the log house meaning he paid for it to be built. He was a St. James the Major. The Major, yeah. I couldn't remember if he was a major or minor, so I figured. Oh, major. Yeah, better off just losing it out. Points there, right? <laughs> So, now, before he ever arrived in Mirror Landing, he came to Albert in 1896, and he went far, far north, up by Fort Lumley and Fort Chippewan and up into the Northwest Territories. So, this is kind of an interesting picture I first saw, I think, when I was in Fort Chippewan, because this is one of their local things. So, there's the thing that's written on it. This guy right here is James Cornwall. The first thing he did was went north and he learned five or six indigenous languages and made a lot of friendships. So before he ever arrived and started setting up trading posts with Fletcher Bredon, he, um, he was up north running boats and that was trapping and trading a little bit. But then the Klondike cold gold rush came and he had four boats I read somewhere up running for over a million sheep on the Peace River. So he went down to Athabasca and started carrying Klondike gold rushers or towing them. So in amongst those people is Robert Service, the poet that wrote Legend of Sam McGee and Which a few other ones. Read his book, okay. Have well, you read it? No. The book Golden I have several, but they're just of the poets. Poetry? Yeah, no, this yeah. is his stories. I bet it's interesting. And Cornwall, it's the best. Cornwall probably would have been in there because I believe it was either him or Cornwall's friend, Captain Shaw, mm -hmm. that took him down the Athabasca River. So, not the first quote unquote famous dude he met, but anyways. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> this is the Grand Rapids of the Athabasca River. So he would have ran those quite frequently. And in fact, when Mayor Landing went to Cootsie because of the railway coming through, he took his steamboats over these rapids to take them to Portland. Wow. Hmm. So where are boats are they? They're... Those rapids. I was getting mixed up on the map, but I'd say they're about half, roughly, very, very roughly, halfway between Athabasca and Port McMurray. Oh, up that way? Yeah. Okay. So, and it's on my bucket list to go to them. Yeah. There's a company called Grand Rapids Wilderness Adventure that they have, somehow they have cabins and they take you down on a jet boat. Mm -hmm. And you get to stay there, but they take you to the historical sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My birthday's in June. So I mentioned Captain Shaw, and this it may or may not be his boat. I don't know, he was a Métis Riverboat pilot in, I can't remember the date, but I, it was probably about 10 years before the Klondike Gold Rush. He's the first guy that took a loaded scow over, over the Grand, uh, Grand Rapids. So these things are 30, 40 feet long. They hold about 20, 30,000 pounds. Wow, and so yeah, so he had a full load of stuff and six nuns and decided to shoot the rapids. <clears throat> And he, and he did it successfully, got his place in history. So, anyways. So in our general vicinity, um, <clears throat> this is a note, and a lot of these pictures actually came from Cornwall's granddaughter. I visited her twice on the island. Right. So this is a Newton family, I guess. So dad tracked from Athabasca River to Lesser Slave Lake, and then the Peace River arriving in September 1898. So that's one year off my book. And so he first traded at Lesser Slave Lake, which we now know as Gerard Capilino First Nation, so he proved that in the And of course, he's tracking up the Athabasca. We're about a half mile from where it is, right? From the Athabasca River. So for those of you not used to the term tracking, <laughs> this is it. They're pulling boats. And can you see the harnesses? They're all hooked onto a line hauling some sort of a 
boat up the river. Yeah, so that's what it is, and generally there's a long string of crackers. But this is probably the wrong boat. Now, interestingly enough, on this, I don't know if you've ever heard of Emerson Few. He was also a novelist, I guess. That's him right there. He's one of Cornwall's friends. This guy was all over the map for people to know. So, there we go. Emerson Few. So anyway, he's up at Lester Slave Lake Post. He, his first trading post, which he was in partnership with Fletcher Bredden. This is it. Um, so this is in 1905. They also, and I'm pretty sure, but I haven't verified, one of the buildings that are there in the Northern Lakes, uh, they have a yard that's fenced in. One of those buildings would have been Cornwall's warehouse. So they sold their trading post to Revenal Brothers in 1906, but they were all over the place with Port Vermillion, Saskatoon, like I think they had like 10 of them all together. So, and they were some of the first free traders to compete with Hudson's Bay Company. So I'm gonna interject there. Back then, the way you got your mail was somebody was going to town so they took it with them, generally speaking, the Hudson's Bay Company. Well, as settlements increased and more businesses and people were in the area, you needed, needed more and more mail delivery. So he kept trying to get the Hudson's Bay Company to let him take his mail, and they never would. So then he started petitioning the government. So he was the first mail carrier. He brought mail, as we know it, into Northern Alberta. Mm -hmm. So, and then this just references some of his other trading posts. Not only did he do the first mail, him and Redden in the Grand Prairie region also brought in the first pigs. <laughs> and I think that's funny because apparently they ran out of feed and this is by the Saskatoon Lake trading post. So there's an island on Saskatoon Lake, which apparently is very aptly named because of Saskatoons. So they just set these pigs loose on this island until it was time to butcher them. And all the pink, all the pigs had pink fat wow. from the Saskatoon. Wow. <laughs> Random tidbits of information, that would be me. So anyways, this is Cornwall again. I think this is at the Fort Vermillion Post, which is also, if you go up to Fort Vermillion and take the Buttertown tour, it's just a self-guided tour around the old settlement across the river from Fort Vermillion is now. His building is still there too, the trading post is still there. So I think this was taken in that. But interestingly enough, his little doggy there, there's many pictures throughout the year where he's stuck with the same breed of dog for his house dog. But he did have sleigh dogs, and I'll show you pictures and tell you a story about them. That's Cornwall with the dog? This is Cornwall, yeah. yeah. And just judging by the looks of them, they were still, that was around 1900, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. So, some of you may or may not have heard of the King murder. This is back in, well, this isn't a picture, isn't it? But he was still in Gruard in 1905. So a guy by the name of Edward Hayward and Charles King went there. They ended up camping on Sucker Creek Reserve. Um, one lady, Sophie Cardinal, was going to sell Edward Hayward a pair of moccasins. So she goes to the campsite, and King's the only guy there. And he's got this huge bonfire. And she said, well, I cooked enough moose meat on a fire to know what burning flesh smells like. And that was it. So Hayward ended up, anyways, killing this guy. And Moose Tooth and Moose Tooth's chief by then started poking around big campfire, found buttons and needles and boots and all sorts of jazz, and went and reported it to Sergeant Anderson, who didn't believe him at first, but it was a funny side story. Moose Tooth took him to his cabin, and here they had collected teeth and parts of skull bones but had them in a tea canister. So they're sitting there having tea and just, well, how about this? <laughs> so it ended up being three, like pre preliminary hearing and a couple of trials, but they took all of these people down to Edmonton three times to testify through an interpreter. And King ended up being hung 
but his original hanging date was August 31st, 1905, which they postponed because Alberta was supposed to become a province on the next day. They didn't want that to discover things, so they postponed it till September 20th. So this is Cornwall, because he was also a witness at that trial. And this is his future wife. They're not married at that point in life, Evelyn. So anyways, and this guy right here is Moose who's who's a chief. Or became a chief like. Mm -hmm. well. So yeah, there's Moose Juice again. So they were actually quite good friends, from what I gather. Um <laughs> I can't say it properly and I haven't verified the exact word, but he said in several magazines that his free name was Palmer Chases, or Palmer Chase, something to that effect. And depending on which, who you're talking to or which dialect, it generally means the guy that wanders about from the traveler, which I guess he is an apt name for that. So the lady that I showed you was Evelyn Turney, and just because she got, they got married in 1908. So that is a picture of her. He proposed to her on a piece of birch bark. He wrote her a poem. He was actually a poet and wrote her a poem and gave her this birch bark. So. so then he was quite tight lipped about some of his personal stuff because there's a Calgary Herald, I think, weekly newspaper, and nobody knew he was getting married. They, they were already married when they stuck out the announcement. <laughs> yeah, so. And that probably was her wedding dress. Right? It was, and her granddaughter actually worked for her wedding too. Wow. Mm -hmm. it gorgeous. So I don't have a picture of it, but here's the receipt from the Royal Albert Museum. Mm -hmm. When I was down there, she had this tenure, like really lacy gown and stuff with a little note attached onto it. And it said something like, yeah, we try to dress up to keep our husbands occupied or something weird like that. <laughs> so it's at the Royal Albert Museum now. It's really pretty. So, mirror landing kind of time. He sold his trading post. What's he going to do? He went to Athabasca and started building steamboats, which was the start of mirror landing. But this is him here. But this sign is in the Athabasca archives. I don't know if it's a re replica or the original. or am guessing it's a replica. But it basically says anything to do with transportation that makes life, men's lives easier is uh, the best thing for civilization. So not only did he get involved with steamboats after that, he got involved with the railways and all sorts of jazz. So. And there's one of his steamboats, which kind of looks by the stuff on there. If he didn't have that steamboat, they'd be packing it on scows and portaging it on the back. So, kind of puts that into perspective. <laughs> so, not only did he have a Cree name, he also spoke Cree as one of his five indigenous languages. And I think this is interesting because when he was running for office as an MPP for Peace River, I can't find any advertisements in English, but there's the one in free. And I don't even think the indigenous people could vote then. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what that says, but it's just kind of cool. 12 foot Davis, there we go. Telford Davis actually died in Girard or Buffalo Bay and was buried in the Anglican Cemetery there. But he was friends with Jim Cornwall, Peace River Jim, and said he wanted to be buried at Peace River. And side story is he's not buried facing the river. He wanted to turn his back on the Hudson's Bay Company, so to speak. <laughs> so, <clears throat> They buried him in Gerard, and I think it was, yeah, 1909. Nine years later, Cornwall hired a guy by the name of, I've heard Pat, I've heard Charles Anderson to dig him up and then move him to Peace River and bury him there. So Cornwall, um, the inscription says he always had his cabin door open. He was 
quote, but Davis was known as a very honest man. So this is the original, and this is what we see today. I know, I'd rather see that first one, but I guess concrete is concrete, so there it goes. But that speaks to me very highly of friendships and commitment to being a good friend. So the other, another thing that he did that I thought was kind of interesting, he was an MPP at this time, but he took a whole pile of people from all over the United States and Canada on a press party. So they all came to Edmonton and you had agriculturists and journalists. Emerson Hume was in on this one as well as some other big name magazines. You can read it over there. Oh, right in here. Um, and took them up on the boats, the steamboats, and did portages and stuff. We took them all the way up to Fort Vermilion, around, um, and down through Grand Prairie and back, trying to promote the North. So that's one of the reasons why he's called East River J, or the Apostle of the North, because he spent heavily to promote it, and that was all on his dime. Nobody subsidized him to do that. In fact, he actually just got right out of a heavy legal battle about railways. Somebody was trying to sue him for a quarter of a million bucks, I think it was. It didn't work, but they tried. And speaking of famous people, this is one of my most favorite photographs of Cornwall. This one's Cornwall, okay. This is Captain Shaw, the dude who ran the rapids. This is in 1912, so this is like almost 20 years after we met him. This is Emily Murphy. <laughs> they were all on a trip together, apparently. Or Having a good time, but it looks a thing. Um, and this is back to the 1910 Peace Party. This is up in Carcadu. I don't know if I said that right. Up by, did I say it right? Yeah. Okay. So this is another, this is Jacques Cardinal, another one of his friends that he talked into doing some promotional bit for the, all these agricultural dudes. So. And now this is promoting. Great wealth will come to the hand of the North Country. <laughs> so, I already said that he took his boats up to Fort Mac. He had as many ties there as he did to our area, really. And one of the first things that he did in 1911 with all of the tar sands was haul the pile again on his own dime. I can't remember how many tons it was. See? I think it was six or eight tons of asphalt type material to pave one of the streets in Edmonton, trying to make a economic development for Fort Mac area. So it seems like a good place. I don't have a picture of it, but the Norman Wells oil field, it was, they were discovered also because of him. So, I mean, this guy's all over the map. If you haven't noticed by now. But he was also in very good shape because in 1916, he had enlisted in the army. This guy came, and back then we didn't have internet and television, so we did things like watch people walk, races. <laughs> Yippee! Anyway, um, so this guy, George Brown, challenged him, and he won by, if I remember right, 15 yards. He walked a professional walker into the, into the ground. And I'm kind of putting his date there when he was 47. This is his enlist enlisting papers, and he lied. He's saying his birth date is 1871, and that's really 1869, because if he didn't lie, he was too old to get the army. Funny. <laughs> Pretty determined to go. So then he did that the opposite. Yeah, he was most 16 and signed up the same day. Yeah, and him, he was 47 and said he was 45, so he could still get in. So when he did go, and this is a little bit later, they um, decided he was going to be, I can't remember if he was a yeah, lieutenant, lieutenant colonel already. So this is from the people up in Fort Mac, saying, oh, best wishes, congratulations, yada, yada. Does everybody here know Christine Potts Alexander? Yeah, I do. You do? Okay. 
So this is also in the Fort Mac area. Now, Captain Shaw, Emil Shaw, this guy, is Captain Shaw's son. So that friendship even extended down through the family line, I guess. And even his wife in 1936 is really good friend of that to him. So, more than just entrepreneurial stuff. So this was taken right before he went to Europe. And he did go to Europe, and he did work on railways there, and trust me well enough. This is one of, I'm going to guess, probably about a dozen medals that his granddaughter has. And I can't pronounce it, but it has something. He didn't get any medals from Canada, I don't believe. But this one, I think, is the French one. If not, there's one in the collection. I'm not a very good medal person. But I sent it to a guy that does medals for history, and he said, get him in the safe. Okay, I'll pass the word on. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that he ever got into the Canadian Hall of Fame, but he was at least a candidate. Well deserved, in my opinion. So, some of the things I haven't mentioned are that the buffalo, Inwood Buffalo, that they I think they brought him up from Wainwright, he barged them up in his barges. Another thing he got to do, <laughs> he made special, but his, there's a letter that's in the provincial archives that his daughter Nora wrote. So he took his kids on that adventure and she remembers running across the tops of the barges looking down at the buffalo. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Anyway, so. so there's a short version. And he passed away in 1955 and had an honors, military honors funeral. And now, people have forgotten about this poor guy, which to me is just funny. So he ended up having dementia and was in Calgary where his family lived in Victoria, so that was pretty good. Questions? about 10 years ago. Um, he built that in uh, 21 or 26, I think it was. I've been in that, I've been in the house. And even that was like state of the art. They were using a siphon system off the rain gutters to collect water and they had silver um, light switch covers and they had an intercom and a safety, like you lifted a window and some alarm go off and I'm thinking, I didn't even know they could do that then, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. So the people that ended up buying it are, last I heard anyways, and this is before COVID, we're turning it into a bed and breakfast or a place for weddings or whatever. And it's wow. a beautiful, beautiful home. Wow. Yeah. Even, even in a state of disrepair. Like they had a nursery for the kids and they had nursery rhymes on painted on the plaster but there was water damage but he was going to try and cut them out and make pictures of the the originals because they couldn't save the room like they had to gut it so yeah there was and then they had a one of those gun waiters but it was on a push button it was just like yeah so 
And interestingly enough, because he's known to be a big, a big man, like physically, but the gloves, like she still has, they used to have those fake collars for when they dressed up and everything in the white gloves. His gloves look no bigger than my hand, but this guy was close to six feet. And I'm like, I wonder if they're stretchy, <laughs> you know, because it just, it didn't, yeah. But she even has the stirrups and all sorts of stuff, or spurs, sorry, his dress spurs. So even that 1910 press party, she come out of the, the bedroom and she said, yeah, my husband wanted me to ask if he knew anything about this. And here all those guys gave him a plate, like a silver platter, and it says, like, thanks for the 1910 press party or whatever, and all these names are engraved on it. Yeah, I know what that is. <laughs> Is it given into a museum? Oh, yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. So. Anyways. I've really been reading Robert Service's book and then I've just finished my The Girls of Mind Up. Oh, yeah. These people walked. Miles and miles. How do you like them most days? They're also going on for the sake of my video that's going on. So. I have up here, if you want to go through some of them, I have homestead records, but I couldn't find one for that piece of property. Mirror Landing is actually two pieces, both on a separate quarter, and then Smith is a different one, like there's like five different homestead records for the River Junction. But I also- So Mirror Landing was actually the, the town of Smith or down by the river? It was a separate town entirely. Right. Smith became Smith because of the railway. So it was named after uh, Rathbone Smith, right. the chief engineer. So when I found his descendants in Virginia, they were a very matriarchal society, I would say that word. Mm -hmm. And Rathbone, I think, died when he was 46. Uh -huh. Young man, anyways. And so when I said, yeah, I live in the town named after him, their response was, when we grew up knowing he was an engineer for the railway, we thought he drove a train. No, he was a general manager when all of the northern track were there. And he was in charge of it. So it was a surprise for them to know his connection to all the So. Which is why I'm here telling stories. Yeah. <laughs> and these pictures, I'm using them. So, anyways. You want to turn that off? <laughs>